Hi, I'm Dominic Spill. This is uh, Mike Osman, and we're presenting uh, What's on the Wireless, um, which is about automating um, spectrum analysis and signal identification and, and things like that. So let's get started. Uh, this is me. Um, I work for Grace Scott Gadgets. I'm a security researcher um, that mostly involves a lot of software writing and um, uh, developing open source tools for uh, security, um, specifically radio and hardware interfaces, and trying to make those easier to, to look at and investigate and hack on. Um, and I'm on Twitter, that's my handle. This is Mike. I'm Michael Osman, and I was the founder of Grace Scott Gadgets and our principal hardware designer. Um, I'm design most of our products, uh, including HackRF, which we'll be looking at today. Uh, that's the big thing in the middle there. And um, HackRF1 is a software defined radio peripheral. Uh, a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is applicable to a lot of different software defined radio platforms. Uh, but we're using HackRF1 partly because, uh, you know, it's our product and we know it well and we like it, but also partly because it is uh, open source and uh, has a ARM microcontroller on it that we're doing some interesting things on. As a business owner, I'm always excited to see when my products appear in the popular press. Um, Excited? Is that the right word? Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I was incredibly excited about this. He was so giddy to have this article in the Daily Mail. Um, My mom's so proud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't even know what to say about it, except yeah. they made some amazing photos. I mean, they really, they really did it up. And uh, the comment section is, um, I mean, if you, wanna, if you want a good laugh, Go read the comments section uh, and see everyone's hot take on uh, RF security. What was the one about hoodies? Yeah, hoodies are the scourge of the past two decades. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to thank Black Hat for the hoodie they gave me. <laughs> uh, we're talking today about software defined radio and waterfall plots will figure into what we're talking about a lot. Uh, we're going to be doing some signal analysis and talking about signal identification and automatic. Uh, modulation classification. Uh, waterfall plots in particular uh, figure into this and, and I'd like to, before we get into this, have a little reading from Parker GTFO 8.4. Uh, the waterfall view is close to how a mathematician would think about signals. All input whatsoever is a bunch of sine waves from all across the spectrum even noise and all. A perfectly clean sine wave such as a carrier would make a single bright pixel in every line. A single bright one pixel stripe scrolling down. That line would expand to a multi-pixel band for a signal that is a, the carrier being modulated by changing its amplitude, frequency, or phase in any way, with the width of the band being the double of the highest frequency at which the changes are applied. These thin pages are so tricky to grab just one. Of course, the actual construction of digital radio receivers has very little to do with this mathematician's view of the signal. While a mix of ideal signs would neatly fall apart in a perfect Fourier transform, the real transform of sampled signal would have to be discrete and would present all the interesting problems of aliasing, edge effects, leakage, scalloping, and so on. Thus the actual receiving circuits are specialized for their intended protocols, particular kinds of modulation, designed to extract the intended signal's representation and ignore the rest. And therein lies Alice and Bob's opportunity. <laughs> the, uh, and I think the, one of the important things to, to realize there, apart from the fact that it is related to the waterfall plots that we're going to show you, uh, is that there, there are opportunities in, across the radio spectrum uh, for interesting signals, for the use of, uh, of radio signals in unpredictable ways to create covert channels, for example, uh, which is what that article is about, and, uh, but also uh, for a variety of attack and defense purposes. And 
we think that it's important that our community has tools for spectrum monitoring so that uh, we, we have, especially as defenders, the ability to monitor radio systems in our vicinity. So I think anyone who's, uh, who's used a software defined radio, the, probably the first thing you do is, is fire something up and, and go and look at the spectrum. And, and right here, this is the FM broadcast band being shown. And, and that's a really good test case. Um, and, and what you can see is that that waterfall plot shows you what's happened historically. At the top, you've got some information um, about the, the current state, a sort of live view of, of the current state of, of the power levels at various frequencies. And scrolling down the waterfall plot, you can see the history. And that gives you a very visual representation of how those uh, transmissions are varying in frequency, which is it's an FM broadcast band. So you would expect them to wiggle backwards and forwards in frequency with respect to the audio being broadcast. And this, this is an interesting way to, to view data. And it's an interesting way to, to see what's going on. But there are some limitations to this. Um, you can see a very small screen size there. So there's, there's a limited amount of information we can show in that space. Um, uh, a waterfall plot is a great method of visualizing data because it's, it's fairly dense. Like we, can, we can pack things in at kind of pixel level. It's better than text for this sort of stuff. But, but we're not going to see very short events. We, we're going to miss them, um, especially if we're not constantly monitoring that, that piece of, uh, of, of screen real estate. And, and it's going to scroll past us very quickly. And then it can only show you a certain amount of bandwidth across the screen. You're still limited by the number of pixels you have. And, and more so, you're limited by the amount of data that your radio can, can receive at a given time. So we can't um, receive more than uh, 20 megahertz at one time on HackRF. I think it's 2 megahertz on the other little RTL SDR dongles that many people will probably have. Like, there are some limitations there about how do we look at what's going on around us. And we're, we've got these kind of blinkers on, and we can only see a very narrow view of the, of the spectrum. So we want to solve some of these problems. And um, in case it wasn't a clue, this slide means we probably did. <laughs> uh, so let's start off. This, this, is, this is not our work. This is um, a, a user uh, by the name of TNT, Syl Sylvain. I've forgotten his surname. We know. terrible. And uh, this is called GR Phosphor. Um, it, it uses a GPU to calculate the FFTs. It inc increases the speed at which it calculates FFTs. So you can see an awful lot more. Uh, you can calculate an awful lot more uh, rows of that waterfall plot um, at, within a given time frame. Now, this makes it scroll much more quickly. You're much more likely to, to miss ongoing trends, but you're going to see those very sharp transient events. And, and if you look at what's being displayed here, you can see much more um, detail of how those frequencies are shifting over time compared with the view that we had on this previous, previous slide. We're able to calculate far more detail and, uh, and pick up very, very quick transient events, which is really useful for when we're looking for uh, things that broadcast very short packets, very short amount bursts of data. Um, it's, it's really handy to be able to make sure we see those. Do you have more? Oh, I, ju I just wanted to point out that I, on the floor here, I just found some uh, mysterious USB device. Do you want to plug it in? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Does anybody else, anybody else want to plug it into their laptop? No? Really? Nobody? Oh, hmm? uh, where's your sensor adventure? Huh? I'll, I'll take it for research purposes. <laughs> um, so, so uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, spectrum analyzers. And spectrum analyzers do, do a, a similar thing to what we're doing here. Um, they, they give us a view of the spectrum. They allow us to, if you will, analyze the spectrum. Um, and, and that's what we were doing there with, uh, with the waterfall plots and what we're doing with the, the GR phosphor view. Um, and these tend to be pieces of hardware that you buy uh, for kind of hardware, ha um, or developing hardware in a lab and, uh, and so on and so forth. And they, they are specifically designed for this purpose. Um, I can't remember what else I was going to say about this slide. <laughs> they, so, so let's take a look at how they work. Um, and one of the ways they work is, is to do an analog sweep. This is a more historical version uh, of how older ones will work. And they will sweep across the frequency range that they support over time and then jump back to the beginning and sweep diagonally and, and sweep. And it, you get a very smooth sweep. But anything. Anything that appears in those white gaps on this diagram is something you're going to miss. And so you've got a trade-off of 
of how quickly you sweep for, for what you might see or miss. And then more modern versions are digital, and they, they tend to um, digitize the, the, the spectrum in the same way an SDR does, and they, they retune in, in jumps. And so again, you've got that same, that same retuning method, you are, you, but you're doing it in stages, you're doing it in steps instead. And um, this allows kind of uh, cheaper and, and who, um, what, I, what the phrase am I looking for? Uh, it, it enables you to, to have kind of some more interesting features of your uh, spectrum analyzer um, and, and lower cost. Um, should I? Sure. Uh, and one of the one of the things we think of as software-defined radio users and developers is that uh, you know looking looking at something like uh, like this, that's something we can do with the software-defined radio platform. We can monitor a little chunk of spectrum and then we can tune it to a new frequency and monitor another little chunk of spectrum and so forth. And we can, in theory, do th the exact same thing as one of these expensive benchtop spectrum analyzers um, with some limitations, like we might not be able to do it as quickly, uh, but, but it's basically something we can do. And it's been done by many folks, uh, mo notably probably the most popular tool in the open source SDR community for spectrum monitoring in this way is called RTL Power. And it's a pretty uh, lightweight command line tool that uh, works with the RTL SDR, the uh, TV tuner dongles. And those are very low cost devices that are super useful for receive their, their SDR receivers. And this RTL Power program basically just successively tunes that dongle to a variety of frequencies over a wide range and outputs frequency, you know, power versus frequency data. That data is output in a CSV <coughs> file. So you can just redirect it to a file and save that or pull it into a database or whatever you want. And there's a fairly popular tool called heatmap.com py that is a little python program that will take that csv file and turn it into a visualization such as this it's a spectrogram similar to a waterfall plot except in this case it's a waterfall that doesn't move it's a large image that has frequency on one axis time on another axis and power represented by the, the color or the brightness of each individual pixel and this one happens to be annotated the you can't really see it down at the bottom of the screen because the text is so small and that's just a side effect of us scaling down an image that is actually very, very large. And somebody has taken the time, uh, Tolan I believe is the person who had posted this, this image online, somebody, ha he had taken the time to, uh, to annotate this and, and describe what different sections of the spectrum were being used for and different features that were identified in this heat map or in this spectrogram. This was captured over a period of 24 hours. And so even though it is a fairly large image and has a, a reasonable amount of data represented, the, the, the speed at which heat map, op, heat map uh, not heat map, but the speed at which RTL power operates is rather slow it requires over a wide band capture like this, this is about two gigahertz of spectrum, over, a, over two gigahertz of spectrum, it requires many seconds just to perform one sweep. And so each horizontal row of pixels was captured over many seconds. And so many uh, transient events were likely to be missed. And we were thinking about this and, and how we might be able to do better. We specifically wanted to increase speed, sweep speed uh, with HackRF because we thought that we, we would have some ways we could do that. And we identified sort of three different things that could be optimized to increase that sweep speed. One of those is the instantaneous bandwidth, which is how much bandwidth we capture at a time. And that's just simply a function of the sample rate. So just using a, a platform that has a higher sample rate gives us a wider bandwidth there. And that, so that's a big win in, in our case. We were, we were capturing with HackRF 20 megahertz of bandwidth at a time versus about a tenth of that 
at a time with the RTL SDR. But we're limited by the maximum sample rate of the SDR platform. Now the capture time can be optimized in theory, however there's a little trade off there. The less time you spend capturing on any one frequency, the less frequency resolution is available within that chunk of spectrum, within that little brick. And so you can only reduce the capture time so much and still be useful. And, but the tuning time, now the tuning time was very interesting for us to optimize because the tuning time is just wasted time. This is the time it takes to tune the SDR platform's radio section, its analog section, from one frequency to another. And the more time that takes, the less time overall that you're actually collecting the information. So if we can optimize the tuning time, if we can really reduce that tuning time, then it's a big win in terms of making all this capture uh, less sparse and giving us more information over the same period of time. So we were looking at that and fairly, in the fairly early days of HackRF, we kind of recognized that we would have an opportunity to optimize our tuning time in one very important way, and that is by completely eliminating USB latency. Now both RTL SDR and HackRF are USB devices that are typically connected to a laptop or some other host computer. And with RTL SDR, the laptop is telling the RTL SDR to tune to a new frequency. And then it captures some information. And then the laptop has to uh, issue another USB command to tell the RTL SDR to tune to another frequency. And those USB commands take a considerable amount of time. There's a lot of latency in USB. So what we've done with HackRF is we've implemented a tool called HackRF Sweep, which is a command line tool that is uh, vaguely similar to RTL Power. But what we do is we also have a little piece of HackRF Sweep that lives in the firmware running on the ARM microcontroller of HackRF1. And the firmware is what controls the sweeping. It's what retunes the radio. So we give one command over USB at the beginning of this operation and then the firmware takes over and handles all the retuning and just spits data back, you know, back over the USB cable and so we only have data going in one direction on the USB cable. We don't have any round trip uh, commands or communication going over that USB link. This greatly increases our sweep rate by considerably reducing our tuning time. Right now we're operating with a tuning time of uh, about 800 microseconds uh, and when we were doing things over USB that was a few milliseconds. So we really uh, significantly reduced our, uh, our tuning time that way. Right. We've reduced that by at least an order of magnitude. Yeah. Like if, if not more. So this is actually uh, a heat map that was produced with output from HackRF Sweep and we didn't bother capturing for 24 hours uh, like that last picture. Uh, how, how long was this? We, we captured this for two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. And okay. the width of this, uh, well the width of the previous image was uh, two gigahertz side to side which is the tuning range of um, an RTL SDR dongle. The width of this is six gigahertz because that right. is the tuning range of HackRF. Um, and one of the things that's notable here actually is Mike had to, to modify heatmap.py to accept timestamps that were in sub second granularity because we're able to sweep zero to six gigahertz in 0.75 seconds. So we were getting output from our, our tool that was uh, having multiple readings for the same frequency within the same second and heatmap.py didn't like that. <laughs> right. It was used to taking multiple seconds to sweep that, that range. So we're able to capture multiple lines of data in the time that RTL power is able to capture one row of pixels, one single sweep. We can capture a couple of rows and we're doing three times the bandwidth. And uh, heat map, by the way, uh, if you find the Git repo for that, uh, I don't think my pull request has been accepted. So you might need to grab that pull request if you want to use this uh, 
If everyone would comment on the pull request <laughs> until it gets merged, <laughs> and that would help us out. Uh, so let's do uh, some demos here before we move on. First thing I want to show you um, actually is just a little um, just a little waterfall plot with phosphor just so people have a little kind of a, a visual image of this. I'm going to tune to the 2.4 gigahertz band which is where we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all that kind of stuff going on. It's a little busy here at Black Hat. I'll set the sample rate to 20 megahertz, uh, 20 million samples per second which is our maximum so that increases the bandwidth that we're seeing here. And so primarily what we're seeing is kind of on the left hand side of the screen there's, there's the upper edge of one Wi-Fi channel and on the right hand side we're seeing the lower edge of another Wi-Fi channel. Uh, and from time to time uh, you may see some Bluetooth devices. So uh, as, as Dominic was mentioning earlier, Phosphor does a great job of kind of solving the problem of missing transient events and it does that by being very fast and displaying everything that's going on on the screen. Now you may think it, it's so fast that it may have some limited utility because hardly any time is actually displayed in this <laughs> spectrogram <laughs> before it's gone, right? Uh, but it kind of makes up for that a little bit by having this sort of probabilistic display up here at the, near the top. You can see, especially look at this red trace. You can see that there are sort of these one megahertz wide mounds that appear. Oh, there are some more. Those are actually individual Bluetooth channels. And so even though a, a particular Bluetooth packet is barely visible in the waterfall plot and just it scrolls off the screen like that, the trend of that Bluetooth channel being used gets gets visualized up at the top section. It's a pretty nice solution and it's a solution based on the way that displays of real time spectrum analyzers work. A real time spectrum, spectrum analyzer is kind of the, the newer type of spectrum analyzer that you can buy. They are quite expensive, uh, tens of thousands of dollars at least and they are essentially very high end software defined radio platforms with a nice user interface. Uh, what TNT did was say, hey, we have these lower end software defined radio platforms uh, but we can use them in the same way and get the same kind of uh, data display and, uh, and that's, what we're, that's what we're seeing here. This is open source software and one of the reasons it's so fast on a lot of platforms is because it does have the ability to take advantage of GPU optimization. It uses OpenCL. So it's a pretty cool thing. But the biggest limitation here I think is that its view is limited to the bandwidth that can be represented with my sample rate. My maximum sample rate is 20 million samples per second here and that means I can't view more than 20 megahertz wide which is like the width of one Wi-Fi channel and that's all I can see at once. Um, but now I'll show you what we do with HackRF sweep. I'll just run HackRF sweep here without any arguments and uh, don't worry too much if you can't see the text on the screen because um, what I really want you to see is just how fast it moves. Right now we're monitoring by default HackRF sweep monitors 6 gigahertz of bandwidth and every time you kind of see the screen kind of glitch to the side that's a new sweep happening. So every time that happens that's a new sweep through 6 gigahertz of bandwidth. Now I'm going to run that through oops I didn't mean to kill that window but uh, Q spectrum analyzer. Q spectrum analyzer is a GUI tool that's designed to be spectrum analyzer like a benchtop spectrum analyzer but for software defined radio. And originally it was written for RTL power. So it supports RTL power as a back end. But we added support for HackRF sweep as a back end. And this has been, uh, this HackRF sweep support has been merged by the author of Q Spectrum Analyzer. So you don't have to grab my pull request or anything. Um, and if you select the HackRF sweep back end, then you can do things like sweep across 6 gigahertz of bandwidth. Now this is the exact same thing. It's running that HackRF sweep that I was just showing you in the background. But this time it's visualizing it and it's producing a waterfall plot here. Obviously this is a much slower waterfall plot than we had with Phosphor 
The reason it's slower is because we only get one sweep every three quarters of a second. That's a sweep rate of eight gigahertz per second. And it doesn't actually matter how wide a bandwidth we choose, we're always going to get, at least with our current firmware and software, we're always going to get a sweep rate of eight gigahertz per second. So we'll actually get a much faster waterfall if we, ch if we select a narrower bandwidth. Uh, right. So, so right now we're showing 300 times the bandwidth that DR Phosphor was showing a minute ago, mm -hmm. and and so we're running at a 300th of the rate. Whereas if we narrow it down to a, a narrower band, that was that was a cue. Yeah, yeah. To do that. Then it uh, then it will go faster. <laughs> but well, actually, before I narrow it down, I just want to show a couple things. Okay. Uh, point out a couple. Things. Here where my crosshairs are centered, that's the 2.4 gigahertz band. So that's that busy band full of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, but there are some other prompt things going on. Um, one, one such thing is down here. But generally speaking, the, the, the most prominent things you're likely to see are, uh, in, in an environment like this at least, are going to be the 2.4 gigahertz band and various cellular bands. Uh, so this very powerful stuff up here is probably like Dominic's phone. Uh, oh no, mine. I, did phone. I took mine out of airplane mode. Um, yeah, there will also be our microphones. Um, yeah. I, you were looking at those this week and they are on. Uh, yeah, those are around here, like this, this peak right here in the upper 500 megahertz. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then obviously there's a small peak at 5 gigahertz, uh, to, which is the, the other Wi-Fi channels. Right. Um, up there. And the, yeah, up here at 5.8 gigahertz in particular is some Wi-Fi activity. The, uh, these microphones, by the way, are, are pretty cool. They support AES-256. Um, but even though they support AES-256, we found out in my SDR class yesterday that they are vulnerable to replay attacks. Um, so I'm going to stop this and just focus in on the 2.4 gigahertz band, which we were looking at earlier. Now since I'm only sweeping across uh, 100 megahertz of bandwidth, which is still considerably more than I could get with, with, reg with phosphor, uh, since we are sweeping across 100, only 100 megahertz of bandwidth, we'll get a much faster number of, uh, a, a much higher number of sweeps per second because we're still sweeping at a rate of 8 gigahertz per second. Now that doesn't look too useful, but let me, there we go. Okay, so this is a 100 megahertz wide waterfall plot uh, being produced by HackerF Sweep and visualized with Q Spectrum Analyzer. So this is the entire 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi and Bluetooth band and, and other ISM things, but mostly around here will be Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and everyone's phone. Uh, and you can see those Wi-Fi channels are big, they're wide, they're very powerful. There's weirdly not one up at the top end, um, but but there are three main main channels and they're occupying most of the, most of the um, the spectrum, and so like we could use this to to go and debug like what's camping on which channel, what, where are we having interferers, where are we, where should we put our Wi-Fi? In fact, we did that in the office. We used this tool to identify that we had uh, an interfering device in our office that that allowed us to move our Wi-Fi channel and get a better performance. Yes, and uh, it's actually uh, not weird that we don't see Wi-Fi up here because the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band oh, in the stuck. United States ends at 2.483, which is yeah, right where my mouse is. So this stuff up here is above the ISM band. The, um, uh, there are Wi-Fi channels that are not legal in the U.S. but are legal in other countries that are up in this section. And there have been situations where in the United States people have used those not allowed Wi-Fi channels to create, uh, as a very easy way to create covert channels. Uh, so this kind of visualization is a good technique to use to find out if somebody's doing that, if somebody's using Wi-Fi on one of the non-standard or not permitted channels in a given country. Is it time to go back to slides? Is that sure. what we're doing now? Yeah. All right. The, the slide's going to look very similar to this view. It is, uh, although it's, here it is. Here we go. So this is something we captured in our, in our lab. It's a little less busy there. Yeah, you can, you can see that we have a one, one Wi-Fi network and maybe, maybe some stuff leaking through from the neighbors. You can also see uh, this area here with our interfering device, which was our microwave oven. 
um, and it leaks far more than we anticipated. Um, and we were taking this what like twenty meters across the lab. Yeah. So like it, and it leaks. Yeah, it, it it leaks a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, 2.4 gigahertz RF in comparison to our, our Wi-Fi router, which was in about the same spot, which, which gives out this. And the, the brighter the color, the, the more power there is there. Um, now, one of the things you might notice if you look at the Wi-Fi packets that we've received is they've got these weird chunks missing out of them. Um, and this is another artifact of an optimization uh, in the technique we use to, to produce the, this um, high sweep rate. Uh, when we were receiving using Phosphor, you may have noticed that there was a spike in the middle of the, the display. And if you've used uh, SDR technology that, that does um, complex sampling before, um, you will have seen this. You'll know what it is. It's the DC offset. Um, it's it's a, just an artifact of the way we, we sample. Um, and, and we didn't want that clouding the display. It's, it's perfectly valid data, but it causes problems in waterfall plots and FFTs because it, it, um, we'd end up with a lot of vertical, like very straight lines, high power lines across this thing. And especially if we're doing a six gigahertz wide sweep, we're doing 300 captures, we would end up with 300 vertical lines that would look like they were more powerful than other things. So we don't want that. So we came up with a technique to, to cut that out. But we still want to see those, those frequencies. We can't just throw away information um, about certain parts of the spectrum because we don't like it. So what we do is we capture on a frequency for a period of time, calculate those at the FFTs to produce the, the power measurements. We then shift by 5 megahertz, capture again, create another set of power measurements, uh, perform FFTs to get those, those, those power values, and we then chop up that data and recombine it so that we always remove oh, there's no oh, there it is. So we always, always remove the center section of every, any capture and the two edges. We remove the two edges because we have a bandpass filter that tries to filter out other data, and that rolls off of the two edges. Um, so we, while we can get 20 megahertz of bandwidth, the middle 15 are, are kind of the, the most um, representative. And, and, and if we're doing this, this shifting method, it, it, the math's worked out nicely that what we do is for 20 megahertz of received data, we get two 5 megahertz chunks. We shift by 5 megahertz, get two more 5 megahertz chunks and then put them all together to generate a 20 megahertz chunk. So what you're seeing in this slide uh, with, with these Wi-Fi packets that we received is you're seeing that the Wi-Fi packet had stopped, transmit stopped being transmitted at the point that we shifted and re received the surrounding pair of, um, of 5 megahertz uh, signals, um, sorry, 5 megahertz chunks of, of spectrum. And so you get these slightly weird artifacts sometimes in, in there. But given that we're sweeping this data so quickly, we're never trying to actually pull uh, data out. We're never trying to demodulate these signals. We're not trying to receive these packets because we're sweeping past them too quickly. We're only, our duty cycle is, is low enough that we wouldn't get any useful data from that. The idea is we're trying to get an overall big picture view of the spectrum, and then we can drill down into those, at which point we won't lose those chunks anymore. Um, so we, we think this is a pretty valid thing to do. And, um, and it gets us, it, it slows our sweep rate down, but it gets us much higher quality data. Now, um, Mike, Mike likes to spend time teaching people about the FFT. And um, sadly, we don't have time for that. But he, he will happily do that in the wrap-up room <laughs> for an hour or two. Um, but one of the things he likes to tell people is it's completely reversible. It's a, it's a transform. It's not a, it doesn't throw away data. It, it converts data from, one, uh, from the time domain, so that's samples over time, to the frequency domain. That's power versus frequency. And we can run that backwards. And so the only reason you'd want to run that backwards is to recover the original data a lot of the time. But one of the things we like to do, because we're already chopping up our FFTs and our spectrum, is we like to chop them up and rearrange them into one huge chunk and then run that backwards that through the inverse FFT algorithm and produce time domain signals as if we really received them. Um, so what we're doing is we're, as we step through, we're taking a small chunk of the, the time domain, and then we're reassembling them in the frequency domain to, to be consecutive, at which point we invert the FFT, and we get back time domain samples as if we had a 6 gigahertz radio. So we take a 20 megahertz wide, a 20 megahertz bandwidth radio, and we produce art data that's kind of artificially at 6 gigahertz wide. Now, it, we're not producing six, uh, 6 gigahertz of data at that full rate, we're producing right. it in, in chunks over time as we sweep. 
but right. we're able to, the, the reason we like to do this is there are a lot of interesting tools out there that help us analyze data from, captured from radios in time domain signals. And so when we produce these, these time domain signals again, we can go and use all this existing software and all these existing tools and techniques that, already, that we already know about to, uh, to analyze this data. And one of those is, as we've already demonstrated, phosphor. And yeah. so that should work with. It should work. Uh, I, just want, <laughs> I just want to mention uh, that, so what, what we're producing here is, if we are sweeping across six gigahertz of bandwidth, regardless of what our sample rate is, which is usually, usually 20 mega samples per second, but regardless of what our sample rate is, after a sweep and after this inverse FFT, we come up with a short burst of simulated samples at a rate of six giga samples per second. So even though we don't have a six giga sample per second ADC, we can simulate that we do. And, uh, and, and as Dominic mentioned, for a very short period of time, and then we get another burst a little bit later at once per sweep. And as Dominic mentioned, that lets us kind of uh, take advantage of some tools that already exist without having to modify those tools. Now, I uh, failed to completely set up my demo, uh, but I'll just do it right now. I have to do a funny little name pipe thing. This inverse FFT trick, uh, most of the stuff we're talking about is already released in the previous release of HackRF uh, that happened a few months ago. But the inverse FFT trick is something new that you'd have to get code out of Git uh, to work. Would you like me to talk about it while you type? Yes, please. That'd be easier. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the inverse FFT trick uh, in, involves, uh, yeah, it, it was built into the Hacker of Sweep tool, but because we want to get it into other tools and it, it's not supported by GNU Radio or anything like that just yet, and, and we'd like to work on that with uh, other manufacturers to, to have everyone be able to do interesting uh, sweeping things simultaneously. Um, but right now, we have to push it through a, a named pipe on our system and, and read it from GNU Radio as if it's a file. And, and this, works, this works pretty well. Um, how are we doing there? Really close. Excellent. That looks uh, like a very complicated flow graph. Yeah, I'll make a simpler one. Let's do, um, uh, let's actually have our whole GUI on screen here. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm just reading in a file that is actually a named pipe. And then I'll just dump the output into Phosphor. So it's purely a two-block flow graph. It's yep. simple. Uh, and we just name the name pipe in there, and it should. And I'm going to tell Phosphor that I have a sample rate of six giga samples per second. Sure, you can call it untitled. Why not? Now it's waiting for some data. As soon as I start feeding it data from HackRF Sweep, uh, I can actually make this go faster if I were to give it a um, smaller FFT bin width. So, so the amount of data we get out of the inverse FFT is equal to the amount of data we put into it. Put into it. Yeah. Uh, and, and so if changing our, our FFT bin width changes the amount of data we use versus the amount of data we throw away. And so by reducing the, the bin width, we, we calculate uh, a higher granularity of, of sample of um, FFTs. Um, and that gives us a higher data rate when we come back out of the, uh, the, the inverse FFT. So what you can see here is this, this is six gigahertz wide sweep again. And it looks like that data um, that we saw from uh, Q-Spectrum Analyzer previously uh, with the same peaks, the same spikes, so we know it's, it's good data. But we can view it in, uh, in GRPhosphor, and we can view it in other tools such as in Spectrum, um, and we can, we can take it offline and, and analyze it there. Yeah, and, and the, the principal benefit here, uh, obviously we're, we're seeing overall a display kind of similar to what we saw in Q-Spectrum Analyzer, but the principal benefit of this inverse FFT trick is that it gives us the ability to pipe our data into an off-the-shelf SDR visualization tool like Phosphor without having to even modify Phosphor. Now let's try this again, uh, just looking at the 2.4 gigahertz band. 
because it just looks cool. I don't know if it's like an And I'm just fooling Phosphor into thinking it has a 100 megahertz sample rate, even though it doesn't really. Well, I mean, it does, but only in short bursts. And this can even be made to go fast, faster. Let's see if we can we let's see if we can push it a bit. Neat, huh? <laughs> so again, we're seeing we're seeing the 2.4 gigahertz band. We're seeing uh, we're seeing those three big Wi-Fi channels and that that drop off at the end. Um, we're, we're but we're seeing a, a much higher data rate than we were in Q-Spectrum Analyzer. We're we're getting better granularity. Uh, we're much more likely to see transient events here, and we're able to use this tool because of the inverse FFT trick. We should get back to the slides because we have more to cover. Oh, but I want to just see how far we can go. Now. It now is not the time, Michael. <laughs> there we go. All right, so we can get much faster data. It might be a little jumpy because my CPU might, might not entirely be keeping up with this. So, so at some point, the, the limitation there is, is the number of samples we receive on the, on the hacker F. Um, and that there is a trade off from that earlier diagram of capture time versus, versus uh, amount of data we can get out. But that the, real, the real limitation there is the CPU power that um, Mike has in his laptop. Um, so we, we will actually be at uh, Black Hat Arsenal tomorrow afternoon. I can't remember what time. Um, but we will we'll be, if you look at the schedule, you'll find us there. We'll be talking about um, very, all these various different tools and, and techniques and, and trying to combine them together. And one place we've been trying to do that is a tool called Shiny SDR. It's a, a web-based platform um, but developed by Kevin Reed. It's uh, backends written in, in Python and, and uses GNU Radio, so it's super easy to extend and, and modify. Uh, we, you get waterfall plots, you get demodulators. So this is what it looks like. This is a, a web interface, and you put this on a box, like running a, a, on a little server somewhere in your environment, and you can remotely monitor that environment, uh, which we think is a really interesting technique. Um, you can see here that we were using the that that hackref sweep technique again because this. Where, where is your mouse pointer? There it is. Uh, this chunk here the sun, is a Wi-Fi channel. It just suddenly cuts off uh, in the in the display. Um, these slides will be online for anyone who needs who's taking pictures of them. They, we'll put them up uh, this afternoon. Uh, this also gives us the opportunity to have multiple radio sources simultaneously. It, it allows us to have receivers, and those receivers can do interesting things with the data. They can can analyze it in various ways um, that we've been we've been experimenting with, and we'll come on to in a minute. Um, and it also enables us to tag the data. And this is this important for us because uh, we'd like to know what the data is uh, going on, um, what, what those signals represent. And so here you can see the 2.4 gigahertz band and is an amateur band and, and various other things. And it, it's tagged in the display. And so you've got a real time idea of like, do I care about what this signal is and, and what it, is this signal something I know about already in my environment? Um, so, one of the things we might want to use the uh, demodulators and the, the decoders for is automatic modulation class classification. Do you want to talk about sure. that? Sure. Yeah. yeah, this is something that I've been looking, working on lately, and um, happy to talk to people about tomorrow in our uh, Arsenal demo and later uh, at our wrap room this afternoon. Uh, but uh, there's Exist, there's some existing open source software already, specifically in a tool for based on GNU Radio called GR Inspector, for automatic modulation classification. And we think this is really important in the long run uh, to try to integrate with some of these other spectrum monitoring tools because, uh, you know, somebody who is an expert in SDR can look at a waterfall plot and very often identify modulations and say, that looks like on off keying, that looks like 2FSK, that looks like Q QPSK, and so forth, that really um, uh, we, we should have tools that can help us do that even for non-experts. And that's the direction that we want to go. So I've been looking at the implementation in GR Inspector, which is based on TensorFlow, and trying to see if I can get that integrated into uh, into Shiny SDR or some other tools. And uh, one of the things I'm starting to look at is maybe there's something kind of 
simpler than a neural net that could be used as a first pass to, to identify some of the simpler modulations. But the more complex modulations are probably things that the neural network approach makes sense for. Um, this is a little screenshot from GR Inspector that doesn't actually show the automated modulation classification feature being used, but it does show how automated power detection is working to identify bands. And so then these bands can then be automatically, once they've been automatically identified, they can be fed into a classifier. So going back to this slide from earlier, the, the drawbacks from the waterfall, we miss transient events. Uh, we, we have limited amount of time display and we're limited bandwidth. And we think we've, I wouldn't say solved those problems, but we can work around those problems using techniques like HackerF sweep, using uh, GeoPhosphor, um, using um, Q Spectrum Analyzer, and, and get more information. And Heat Map also helps us there, I think, solve those problems. So, one more thing, um, which we, we actually didn't run our demos using this today because, uh, because it's pretty new, but one of the issues that, that you may know if you've played around with radio uh, SDR a lot or worked with SDR uh, and radio in general is, is you need to pick a good antenna because we're looking at the amount of power on the radio spectrum at a given uh, point in time where we, we need to know that that power level that we're looking at means something. And if our antenna is not tuned to the, the frequency that we care about, uh, that we're looking at, then, then we're going to see um, lower power levels than we would anticipate, and we're going to see artifacts and, and things like that. So we, we want to have a better idea of how the, uh, the we want to have a, a better view of the spectrum. And one of the ways we do this is with an antenna switching board, which is attached to the top of our, uh, our hacker ref here, and as you can see in the diagram, and uh, in, the, in the image. And this is a test we were running in the hotel room last night that we have multiple antennas hooked up to this switching board, and the hacker ref knows which antenna is attached to which. We tell it in advance which antenna is attached to which port. And then the hacker ref has firmware which knows to switch antenna port to the appropriate antenna for what it's trying to receive at the time that it retunes. And this runs very quickly, and so we're able to run it at a, um, a fast enough rate that we can keep up switching antennas in, time, in line with hacker ref sweep at that 0.75 seconds for, for a complete sweep. It can, it can switch back and forth between those antennas more than quickly enough. Yeah, since it's implemented in firmware, the antenna switching happens in a matter of several nanoseconds, which is way less than the time it takes to, for the thing to actually tune to a new frequency. Uh, so we can arbitrarily choose a new antenna every single time we retune the radio with no trouble at all. Uh, so, so another thing this board can be used for um, is, is to do direction finding. If, if we want to have, a, again, a better idea of what's going on around us wirelessly, we might want to actually find a physical device. We might want to know where that, that uh, device is coming, that signal is coming from. And um, the gentleman on screen is Mike Davis, and he's going to be giving a talk tonight at the Cyber Spectrum event at the Sin Shop Hackerspace. And um, he's going to be talking about direction finding using this technique with our, with our antenna switching board. And he will use uh, pseudo Doppler um, to, automate, to switch between these very quickly to look at phase shift that uh, gives us that information about direction finding. Um, so that's worthwhile if you have no other plans tonight. Uh, of course, it's up against the Pony Award, sadly. But yep. uh, both both ponies and the Cyber Spectrum yep. are good things for you to do tonight. Uh, Cyber Spectrum is great with uh, not just Mike Davis speaking, but a whole bunch of uh, SDR enthusiasts getting together and talking about projects. We are out of time, but we'd like to thank uh, the people on the screen: Kevin Reed for Shiny SDR, Mike Walters to help for his help with Hacker F Suite. Uh, Michael uh, Krennic for oh, um, Q-Spectrum Q Analyzer. Analyzer. And uh, we had a couple of interns this summer who added some features to Shiny SDR for us. So uh, Jacob Graves and Ellie Pulse. Uh, we'd like to thank them both. And we will take questions in the wrap-up room um, now. South Seas H. South, South Seas, Seas H. H. If you have any South questions. Seas H. Thanks, everybody.